I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. All right, so another episode of Wall Street Insane with Dan and Omid. And just if you haven't heard of these other prior episodes, Dan, you and I have worked together since 1999. That's correct. And Omid, you and I worked together from about 2002 to about 2009, 2008, something, something like that. Something like that, yeah, yeah. We day traded together. We ran a hedge fund. We did venture capital stuff. Dan, in particular, you and I did a $125 million venture capital firm. We did a fund of hedge funds. We started businesses. And we just had so many crazy experiences. In prior episodes, we described our experiences with Bernie Madoff, Yasser Arafat, Jim Simons. It's almost weird saying these names just because who has experiences with Bernie Madoff, Yasser Arafat? Yeah. Part of the idea of this is that Wall Street, I would say it's like 95% BS and 5% the legit funding of an economy. And we experienced that directly. We were dead center in the middle of it. And if you remember, and this is, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but when you just said all those names, it made me think there were some banks that we dealt with. If you recall, when we were doing different deals in the hedge fund and not where we ran into a number of DC political heavyweights that we were shocked at how you would think someone who was far right and far left would never be in the same room together. And we couldn't believe how close knit and buddy, buddy, and how basically no matter what happened, both sides won, you know, if you were a DC insider. I totally forgot that. Yeah. We almost should do that this episode. Maybe we'll do that next episode. Yeah, it's, but, it, but just throwing out those names, it's funny how many people we ran into that was shocking. It was nonstop. First off, you don't have to listen to prior episodes to appreciate each episode of kind of self-containing, but it's just shocking how many stories we have. And I wonder if everybody who was in the business had these stories or just us. And my theory is not everyone has these stories because I've talked on this podcast with other hedge fund managers and people who work for hedge funds. And there are some stories, but our stories seem to have a lot of diversification. Like it's all over the spectrum. And I think it's because we had zero pedigree. Correct. Like the typical financial hedge fund asset manager has this path, went to Harvard, worked at Goldman Sachs, then worked for a large hedge fund, then 
spun off and did their own hedge fund, built up. That was a very normal path. We were like, like I worked at HBO and then, you know, wrote some software for day trading after losing all my money. And then gradually we pieced together, we raised money in this haphazard way. Oh, man, you had just graduated college. Dan, you and I had worked together at the venture capital firm. You had a more traditional background. You worked at Credit Suisse. You worked for a private equity fund. You kind of were the traditional guy. That's probably right. That's probably right. But but also, James, I would add to that. So there was the no pedigree thing, which meant that we had to hustle. Yeah, we had to hustle in a weird way. We were hustling. And then you had this remarkable ability to get the meeting, which like to this day, I don't know if I've known anybody who, as someone without that pedigree and without the connections, somehow you would say like, and I remember sitting next to you, there'd be times like, Oh, have you heard of, you know, this hedge fund manager, blah, 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 Izzy Englander? I'm like, wait, that's one of the biggest hedge funds in the world. And you're like, yeah, I'm meeting him next week. <laughs> I was yeah, like, I had yeah. lunch with him. I had lunch with him twice or three times on three different strategies. He wanted me slash us to work with him. So Izzy Englander, one of the biggest hedge funds out there. And this was during a period, gosh, we didn't even talk about this one, where we had a strategy that we had programmed up where if you follow the trades of all the biggest hedge funds out there, like all the activist hedge funds, they, you know, they have to do a filing whenever they take a big position. If you just piggyback all of those positions, you'll do better than them. And First New York, which was a small trading firm and uh, slash bank, they funded us for a while to do trading. We made a lot of money with them. And then Izzy Englander wanted us to do that strategy for him. I was writing for the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal. He wanted me to stop writing. This actually will factor into another story today, but I didn't want to do it because what if I stopped that writing and what if I didn't do well for him? I wouldn't make any money because he would pay like 30 or 40% of the profits, but no salary. So you can make millions or you can make zero and lose your career. But the angle also that was fascinating at the time, you look back on it, and you realize it, but at the time you didn't. But I mean, this is 02, 03. I mean, the internet was obviously thriving, but it was still early days in the sense that you were able to get those meetings. But what was always so fascinating to people was your background at Carnegie Mellon, right? You had this yeah. PhD candidate, computer science. Here's a guru that that understands something in a way that others don't. So people have been trading maybe that way forever, but you were saying, no, 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 no. I can program all that behavior. I can figure all that out. And I think people were still at that time fascinated by that. Yeah, there was like, like now the quant hedge fund thing is, I would say, almost done even. But at the time, it wasn't. It was just a very small community of people who would program up trading strategies. I will add... The brutal honesty where you would lead with, well, no, I didn't get my PhD from, Car from Carnegie Mellon. I was kicked out. I think yeah. people love that. <laughs> I think people love that. I was basically having two careers simultaneously. One was all of our hedge fund day trading stuff and then the fund of fund and so on. But then also I was writing for thestreet.com and, and I was going on CNBC and I was writing for the Financial Times and I was writing books. And so I think that helped me get the meeting too, is that because of the internet, everybody writes sometimes. You write a Facebook post, you write a blog post, uh, an article, but there are more people who write than there are actual writers. And since I had spent a lot of time the decade before trying to be like a professional writer and writing novels and all that stuff, I had a little advantage over other financial writers. So my name was getting out there a little bit more than the typical guy who would say, buy Apple today and not really say anything interesting. Right. So I, I knew how to put things in an interesting way, like in a more writerly way than other financial writers. But you're right. Like I don't return phone calls. I have horrible habits with networking. I don't go to parties. We didn't know anybody in the hedge fund subculture really. And somehow or other, we ended up in the middle of a lot of, just by accident too, a lot of storms. Yeah. But there were a lot of interesting people that we ran into, notably, I mean, the original backer of our hedge fund, the three of us trading together. I mean, I don't know how you met Victor, but... Okay. So Victor Niederhofer, well-known hedge fund manager, famous forever. 
in, I think it was in 1998 or nine, or no, it was like 1995. He wrote the book, the education of a speculator, which is one of the best investing books of all time, because he is a great writer. Yes. And, and it was one of the first real popular, like best selling books about or by an investor. And I forget if it was 97 or 98. At the time, he was the most successful hedge fund manager out there. He was winning awards left and right. But he had a particular strategy where he very consistently returned huge amounts. But it always was possible with his strategy to completely blow up and go to zero. And so there was one time in one 24-hour period, he lost 100% of his money in a day. <laughs> and he lost everything. And I remember his story was he had to sell silverware to make money to pay the mortgage and stuff. But then a few years later, he's a very charismatic guy. He was a former, I think he was a former world squash doubles champion, big guy. He would wear these kind of almost flamboyant outfits. And he was so, so smart. Like he knew something, he knew a lot about a lot of different topics. And he himself had been a top head trader for George Soros. He had got his PhD in economics from the University of Chicago, squash champion, super athlete. So he had a lot of charisma and was always able to raise money. So he raised money again. And what happened was, is that I was starting to do my day trading. And Dan, you and I both were doing the yeah. day trading based on the software. And I knew that was his strategy. So I sent him ideas that I had programmed up as good strategies. I knew it was similar to his trading style for in his group. So he invited me to his house. And I remember I was, I got lost. There was no GPS then. I got completely lost. I was two hours late. I was literally crying in the car because I figured here was this opportunity to meet this guy who I admired and respected. I was two hours late, but he was very kind about it. He answered the door. We had lunch. We talked about all these different trading strategies. And over time, we got to know each other and he eventually allocated money to us and we started trading and that was the beginning he was the original money. yeah he was actually if you remember james victor is how you and i know each other how we met through indirectly through him because if i recall yeah. the sequence of events correctly so victor was a sort of a mentor to me when i was in college and beyond and to this day i actually owe a lot a lot of my professional success to him and also many of my closest now personal relationships are people who I met through him because he would do this thing where he would just one he talked to anybody and then you talk to him and he'd be like you should talk to this guy and then he would just like give you a random email address and then I have like lifelong friends almost now that I met through that way but if I, I was out of college and it was the 2002 recession and I was trying to get work but Wall Street jobs were hard to come by but one of the people who I had met through Victor was Pamela Van Giesen. Pamela at the time was at Wiley. I believe she was in charge of their business books. She published my first three books. Right. So she, she published Victor's book. And then she also published your first three books. And then at that time, I had met her through Victor. She was very kind with her time. And she knew I was looking for work. And she said something like, I have this really interesting author in the city who you might want to meet. And that was you. So that's how we met. And I think like the first time we met, we had sushi lunch somewhere and just talked well, about no, we, stuff. We met the very first time we met, I want to say December 2002. And I think it was Victor's birthday party. I, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. And by the way, to finish that story, Pamela in retirement, now running a successful donut business in central Montana. Uh, oh my gosh. Yes, yes. I had no idea. Yes, amazing. Like Daisy Donuts... People should Google it. If you're in that part of the country, place an order. You will not regret it. But in her spare time, she was the editor on my new book, Rearchitecting Trust. So everything has really like come full, come circle. full circle. Yeah. Well, I believe she was at Victor's party, Victor's house in December. This is actually, an, it was an important day for me for an odd reason. She was at, I believe, Victor's house for this party he was like his 60th party, birthday party, something like that. And she introduced us. And then we had lunch afterwards um, a couple of okay, days later. It's possible. Later. Yeah. That, it might have been like that. Because Victor would have these also these amazing parties where, and this was the part that was to his credit. Whereas I feel like 
if you went to any other hedge fund managers' parties in where he lived in Connecticut, you would just meet a very specific kind of person from that industry or the specific kinds of hangers on who yeah who are like orbiting hedge fund managers and you go to these parties at Victor's and you would just meet the most interesting and unique random people who had nothing to do with Wall Street or finance or money or anything from all over the world so many different things i learned from Victor and and Victor by the way is just a larger than life character and by larger than life i don't mean it in the necessarily cliche way i mean I don't know if he was a happy man, a sad man. You know, he was definitely a little eccentric, but he was really alive. Like he definitely maximized every moment of his life. And so one thing I learned from him was that if you're interested in trading, you must be interested in other things. So he was always asking questions like, how can, you know, the fact that we could figure out the age of trees by how many circles you know, are inside when you cut it open, how can that relate to trading? Or how can Ted Williams style of hitting a baseball relate to trading? Like he, he would yeah. relate, he would read so much and understand so much at a professional level, just so we could try to figure out new things about trading. Second, his philosophy was don't invest it unless you could measure it. So if I said to him, Oh, this stock looks interesting because it has a low PE ratio. And he would say, did you test that? Did you test that stocks with low PE ratios have a tendency to go up? Otherwise, you cannot make that trade. Like everything had to be tested. And I want to, just to accentuate this to your younger listeners, right? This is 25 years ago or 30 years ago, he started doing this. So he was a quant before the word existed, right? Like now yeah. every junior yeah. trader learns how to program in Python. And this is commonplace now. But back then, like most people on Wall Street, almost nobody was doing this. You had a lot of these pseudoscientists who are like technical analysts that are up there telling you about like, well, the MACD or the Bollinger Band or whatever. And then Victor was like, well, test it. Like you say that this is bullish because of some relationship between the numbers, get the data, which wasn't as easy as it was today, but it was doable. And then write some code and come back and tell me like the last hundred times that happened, what percent of the time was it actually bullish? You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James daily fantasy sports made easy.
the future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking, Dan Brown on writing, or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov. You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. It's very interesting. You know, I, I would refer people to an article that the young writer at the time, Nassim Taleb, wrote about Victor because Nassim Taleb's point was that he was always on the opposite side of Victor's trades. And so that's an article that was in The New Yorker 25 years ago. It very much described both Victor and Nassim's style. And it kind of led to the conclusion that one day Victor will blow up, which he did. Now, he didn't blow up necessarily because of his strategy, but because he played it with a lot of leverage. So I remember one time Dan and I we were in Chicago at the, what do you call it? The Mercantile Exchange or the yeah. Chicago uh, Commodities Exchange, whatever. We were trying to raise money from all these commodities traders based on our quant strategy. And we would mention that Victor was our seed investor. And they were all like, oh, Victor Niederhofer. We remember it was, whatever the day was, they would say the exact day that Victor blew up and say, Victor, Victor bought my house for me because they really were on the, they actually were on the opposite side of Victor's trade. Yeah on that one day. Yeah. And the great thing about him being the first, the seed investor for what we were doing is good, bad, or otherwise, we use that and people respected that. So when we were going to people with what we were doing and our strategy and they would say, well, you know, do you have any investors? Is there anyone? We would say, well, yeah, Victor Niederhofer seeding us. And that instantly, even if it just created a, a conversation because people had known all oh, Victor blew up or Victor had this approach. It still got us in the room, got us the meeting. And in most cases, I think helped us because even if people thought, oh, Victor used too much leverage or, you know, he could be reckless or, or, or not, it's still, they respected his intellect and his, you know, knowledge of the trading game. This is a very important point because, you know, we talked at one point about a fund manager from England who was blowing up because of a scandal and he had to fight it all the way in court because 
there's no second chances in England. He he was out of business if it didn't work out. In America, you can get a second chance. Like Victor had only blown up a few years earlier, but everybody respected him. And again, he was larger than life. We would go to his house. And for the first time I went to his house, I'm thinking to myself, well, he blew up. So maybe it was a small house. I had no idea. It was the largest house I've ever been in. First, there was this indoor squash court in the house. And then there was all these weird rooms that you could stumble in. Like there was one room where I think the room was just devoted to, he collected toys that were made in 1850. <laughs> and it was a room just devoted to that. I'm probably getting the year wrong, but it was, it was something like that. Then there was another room where there was all these weird things that he would collect. Like for instance, he had the signed police affidavit of when Ted Kennedy had the Chappaquiddick incident so that he would have like the police report framed in this room and like other weird documents like that. And, you know, and then he would just do weird things. Like once a week, he had a checkers lesson from former world checkers champion. I have enormous respect for Victor and always will and always did. It didn't really end well because I started writing and I was writing our strategies. So we had a particular pattern that worked. I would write about it. And particularly when my book came out, he was like, how could you write about all of these strategies? They're not going to work anymore. And I'm like, ah, nah, don't worry about it. But he was right. They didn't work. And he basically just cut things off with us at that point. Yeah. So that was, that was that. Yeah. I mean, there was more to that story, but we don't have to get into every detail. I think the other part of it was- There was that, my infamous checkers match with him, but yeah. I'll leave that to the side. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was a competitor, right? My sort of conclusion of him was that so long, if he viewed you as a protege, an underling, an employee, something like that, then he was the kindest, most hospitable, most helpful person you could ever meet. And that was like, I actually experienced all of those things from him. But the second he viewed you as a competitor, then the gloves came off. Yeah. And, and look, some of the most successful hedge funds in history now spun out of Victor. Everybody working for Victor kind of starts off the same way. But some of these people went on and I thought we would be like that as well. But like Toby Koppel has the exact same strategy as Victor as the like, I don't know if he's still running his fund, but it was $10 billion. And then there was the guy in Stock Market Wizards, the book Stock Market Wizards, Monty something spun out of Victor. One of the best hedge funds this year, they're winning awards, is his younger brother, Roy Niederhofer, has, is up huge on a pure quant-driven approach. And then the guy who broke the story on mutual fund timing and started the whole scandal on mutual fund timing also once worked for... Victor. So he had a lot of uh, interesting people that were his, both his investors. And, and I think the reason he fell out with George Soros is because he was very quant focused and George Soros was more gut focused. As we know, Omid, from your friend Flavia, who I guess worked a little with Soros, that if Soros is back hurt, that right. means meant he should get out of a trade. Right. I thought for all the testing and data and analytics, which he would do day and night and have all his people do, he had the best gut on the S&P 500 of anyone who I've ever met. And there were just these times where he would just randomly out of nowhere in our like, if you remember for a while, we had this email group of traders and stuff. He would be yeah. like, just out of nowhere, be like, I really feel like tomorrow's going to be a big up day. And, and like no one was even thinking about that. And then suddenly it would be like the biggest update in six months or something like that. And he had a lot of good wisdom about the markets too. Like I remember one time there was some weird action where the S and P 500, you know, did a mini crash and hit a round number and then it bounced right back up. And he, he said, usually it goes, we think that was a mistake, but usually it'll go back there at some point. And he was always right about that. The one thing I'll say too, being our first investor, he was also very unique. I thought if we were struggling or if we had a bad string of trades or if we were down, he would almost be reaching out saying, relax, guys, like it's fine. You'll work this out. As opposed to investors we had after him, you know, we always felt this need to post positive months or positive week right. or mm -hmm. always, you know, anytime they would call, we, you know, we had the greatest trade ever. He was obviously just much more, I don't want to say relaxed about it, but he understood what we were going through and he was almost allowing us to work through that. As a matter of fact, and I might be wrong on this, I feel like he added 
to us when we were in a down stretch? You know, a lot of it was we were trading off of his leverage and that he was allocating to us. I think, I don't know yeah. for sure, but you, you reminded me though of one of the things that, that disappointed him about me. So we were up at one point over 100% for him in a fairly quick amount of time using this quantitative approach, using our quantitative approach, which was a little different than his. And he wanted us to press on the accelerator when we're having a good time like that. But I was thinking in terms of we needed to develop a good track record. And if you go raise money and you say, hey, I'm up 100%, everybody runs away because they think you're too volatile, which we are. We know Victor blew up. So I dialed it back right when Victor wanted us to accelerate. Like I wanted to be up one, 2%, not 50% in a month. And so I dialed back our leverage a lot. And he was, that's when he was really upset. Like yeah. he wanted us to make money, not be up 1%, even though it was a lot of money for him. Like, you know, it was, we were making a lot of money no matter what. He was very disappointed that I didn't want to hit the accelerator because I was thinking in terms of raising money for a hedge fund. I didn't want to be reliant on, it's like with any business, you don't want to be reliant on one investor, which, you know, by the way, we never talked about how we did raise a significant amount of money after that. We ran into one of my readers at the time I was already writing for the street.com and some other places. So one of my readers called me and, you know, we talked for a while. He was in the middle of a trade that was not working out for him and he was a little down about it. And I kind of encouraged him and we kept talking on the phone. And then he wanted to raise money for us, in particular, the former CFO of WorldCom. <laughs> so like World, Bernie Evers, was this, who was the CEO, was already in jail. But this guy was the CFO before things got bad with WorldCom. And that guy and a few other people put five or 10 million or so, some amount of money with us and really got us going. Then we raised millions more from you know some funds of funds. And we were really in business. We were making decent money. And I remember he wanted us to go down to Mississippi and did you go down to Mississippi? I, I did Dan? not. No, no. Yeah, you went down. Yeah, with yeah, with. No, but I I didn't go down. I didn't want to go. I so badly did not want to go to Mississippi that I did something I swore I would never do, which is I went on TV instead as an excuse. So this was before Mad Money. I went on Jim Cramer's show with Larry Kudlow just to avoid going down to Mississippi. Because I really just detested the idea of going on TV. And later, I regularly went on TV, but I was so scared and so nervous. But yeah, so that got things going. And then that was useful for us. And then, of course, we raised a lot of money after we helped sell the mental health facility. And we were making 20% on each trade. So here we were like trading $50 million at this point with leverage. And we were making some good money. We had some decent trades going. And then there was one trade where we lost a half a million dollars in one day. And I had never lost that much money for someone. I had lost that much money for me in one trade, but I never lost that much money for someone else in one trade. And I was so horrified. I remember after the close, I took a walk and I was kind of crying and I, I called my mom and my mom said, just get out of this business. Like you're miserable. Just, just get a job <laughs> and you're miserable doing this. And I'm like, I can't get a job. I just can't do it. I, don't, I haven't had a job in a while. I don't know. I don't know how to have a job anymore. And then I remember, Dan, you and I were always talking like, maybe we should just like make diet pills or nutraceuticals yeah. and do an infomercial <laughs> and sell diet pills. And it's very miserable to trade. Like, Oma, did you have as much misery trading? Not as much as you, but I don't remotely miss it. And yeah. I would never want to go back to it. I think it takes a certain personality type, frankly, to be good at it. Like one, you have to have be the prototypical ice in your veins, can handle the risk, blah, blah, blah. But the other problem that you and I both had as traders is we really cared about our investors. And losing money for other people is something we took personally, which the most successful traders and money managers, to me, don't care. And I'm not saying that, in, like, I'm not criticizing them. You almost have to have this right. attitude that, hey, it's a business arrangement and you always knew it was risky and I tried my best. Sorry, I just lost all your money. Yeah, like, and you look at, like, the most famous hedge fund managers or, or investors out there. Like, there was a, a quote-unquote trend follower, huge hedge fund 
it was his, I think his name was John Henry, the guy who owns the Boston Red Sox. Yeah, yep. yeah. and so if you look at his track record, he was down over 20% a year, his first two years in business. Like huh. there is zero chance I would have kept that business going if I was down 20% like that yeah. in the in the first six months. Even. We would always be fascinated if you remember, and I can't remember the website, but the three of us would always, we would look up, it was a database of all the hedge funds and trading firms out there. We would drill down on yearly returns and this firm had seven down months in a row, but they're still raising money. And so it obviously does take a very unique mindset to be able to weather that type of downturn and still raise money and still believe in, in what you're doing. You have to, on the one hand, not care at all, but you also have to be extremely good with people because imagine you invest in some young guy who has an idea and he's down 20% the first year and then he's down 20% the second year. Who stays with an investor like that? Like I would have pulled all my money also if I was an investor. So John Henry being an example here, he must have been very good at telling people, hey, no, stick with me. This is going to work. We're setting up for a huge return. And then he had many years of very huge returns and built a multi-billion dollar business. Like he became a billionaire. He bought the Boston Red Sox. The phenomenon of people who have very high returns when they're managing 20 million, 50 million, 100 million, and then lose 10% when they manage 100 billion. Or, or, and then you do the math yeah. and you're like, wow, across their career, they actually like lost more dollars for their clients right. than made dollars for their right. clients. I would say almost every hedge fund, this is where the hedge fund business ultimately, I think we all realized, was largely a scam. There's so many reasons that it's a scam. A, the fees are too big. B, you're right. As soon as they raise a lot of money, even if they lose 10%, they've net net gave more money to the market than what they took. Right. And I would even throw George Soros probably in that category. They always say, oh, he broke the pound in 1992. It was a billion dollar trade he made in one day. But then he went short internet stocks, right? In 1999, they went straight up. And then he started buying them instead. <laughs> and John Paulson's another one. We've talked about John Paulson in a prior episode. He made so much money in the financial crisis. And then he started a gold fund and just it was a disaster. So I was going to bring up Paulson with your prior point. You talk about John Henry and two years down 20%. You know, we would never touch something like that. That type of approach is why we, we decided to pass on on John Paulson. Yes, so. he was down 1% a month right. for like two years in a row. And then he was up something like 600% in one month. Right. In September of 2008, I think it was, where you know the, everything blew up and that's what he was waiting. That was his trade. Which kind of makes the point that we always talk about. Trading obviously is extraordinarily difficult. It's just from a mental and psychological standpoint, it's very hard to do. And I think that's where I think Omid was a lot better than we were and stuck with it longer than we did. And I think if you recall, I think it was in the San Francisco airport, actually, we were coming back from a West Coast trip where we were raising money for the trading and the fund of funds. And we were like, what are we doing? Like, we can't, this is really hard. You know, this is difficult. And we were just sitting there brainstorming different random ideas. And some of them were wild and had nothing to do with investing. And some were related to investing. And we talked about piggybacking how we had done. And we had done that years prior. All three of us had, had kind of played with that type of trading where you're piggybacking the quote unquote, the biggest and the smartest. And I think that was the beginning of Stock Picker, at least the idea. Well, you're right. I remember that West Coast trip. We went to Seattle, where I think we were. We had an invitation to pitch the Seattle Teachers yes. Pension Fund, yes. and that was one of the worst meetings of my life. I don't know what <laughs> happened there. And then we went down to I think La Jolla, where we were meeting those people who raise money for funds, and they loved us. But that was where we were stuck in some meeting, and our lawyer was telling us how he had a fist fight with Frank Sinatra. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he had like the craziest stories. I don't know what the deal with him was. I won't mention his name because I'm pretty sure there was some shady stuff going on there. Like he lived with John Casablancas for a while who ran the modeling fund. But now, I don't know, he had to leave the country because of Jeffrey Epstein style <laughs> issues. And not our lawyer, but just somebody he lived with. We're not saying anything disparaging there. But he had these like insane stories of like people he would... He would meet or fight or... Yeah, he did on that, on that trip. And 
he was responsible for getting someone fired from one of the funds on that trip, if you recall. Oh yeah, yeah. No, we met, we did mention that. Yeah, like that guy was rude to us. Yeah. And then our lawyer complained, and that guy was fired the next day. Our lawyer did not like the way in which he was conducting due diligence on our funds. Yeah, which That's, was perfectly reasonable way to conduct it. We didn't even know. I think we got back to New York, and we all got back to our office, and we got a letter from the head of that fund who was an investor in us apologizing for that guy's behavior and said he had been terminated and we were like for, for what would he would he do we we didn't mind yeah. we thought it was kind of fine but our lawyer took exception and and uh that was that Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra- I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. It was on that trip when we started coming up with different ideas 
and what ultimately led to Stock Picker and your background and connection with the street and Jim and it kind of brought everything together: the trading, the investing, the fund of funds, my experience building websites, our computer experience, our software experience, my writing skills, and my connections with thestreet.com and Yahoo Finance and AOL, and that becomes like a whole story. But before we started Stock Picker, we tried, and I remember this, we tried nine other ideas first. We'll get to those in the next episode. But Stock Picker was so insane because it combined every skill set we had. And from the official launch to the day we sold the company was just four months. And we sold it for a valuation of $10 million. And it also led to the initial breakup with Ovid. And uh, yeah. uh, it was an intense story, but it was all driven by the fact that what we started with in this conversation today, we just did not have the normal pedigree. And it was proving just a little bit too hard to raise money. Like we had raised 40 million here, 20 million here. Like we, we were raising like in the tens, but to be a legit hedge fund at that time, you needed at least a hundred million. To be a legit hedge fund now, you need at least a billion. We were making a living, but barely. Like it wasn't really a great living. We probably had about 60, 70 million in assets overall. At least back then, the problem with the math was that the hardest money to raise was from 10 million to 100 million. Yes. Because you get to 10 from friends, family, your own money, people like Victor. And we actually met people at the time who were like, I would like to invest in your trading or the fund of funds, but I need to make a minimum $25 million investment for it to even matter for my portfolio because they were too big or bureaucratic or whatever. And they were like, I'm not going to become 80% of your fund. So there were all these people who were like, call me when you get to 100 million. Call me when you get to 200 million. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the other thing is people realized that we were only on the verge of making a living. So we were so desperate to raise money that they would use that to negotiate fees. So ah. to hardly any of our investors paid full fees. And Oma, that always uh, upset you. Like, And this is an interesting thing about sales. Sometimes the salesperson shouldn't always make the decision because my goal in a meeting was just to get them to say yes. So the way I often had to get them to say yes was by agreeing to cuts in fees. I got them to like me and want to put money in, but then we weren't really making money from them. The flip side is we need to get to that 100 million point. Right. And we talked about this in the first episode. We had that Italian family office that wanted to basically pay almost no fees, but they were going to put in like $50 million. And we ended up rejecting them because they literally were going to pay the tiniest fee, like lower fees than a mutual fund even. So at Omen, I think you were really forceful. And Dan, you agree with Omen t- that we shouldn't take them. And then I agreed. In retrospect, though, I do think we should have taken it just to get the just to accumulate mass. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I think our opposition or my opposition was that I was like the junior IR person who would deal with our investors. And there was such a dichotomy between the blatant lack of respect that the people who paid no fees showed to all of us, like they call and yell demanding their K-1 for the fund of funds. And I'd be like, we literally cannot give you a K-1 because we have to wait till all of the funds we invest in give us their K-1s. And they wouldn't care. And then the people who paid full fees were like the nicest, friendliest investors who never bother us about anything. And, and maybe this is an important lesson for me as kind of a salesperson, because I had this problem in, in a prior business too, when I was had the business of making websites, I would agree to do some huge website for almost no money because I thought it would be prestigious. And all my employees and partners would be upset at me, like we're not making any money on this. But I would always have other reasons. No, it's important for X, Y, Z reasons. And picture someone like Don Draper from Mad Men. He would never agree to lower fees, for instance. Like I just maybe didn't have enough confidence in myself to to negotiate. Or this, and this I know this happens for both of you guys in different areas, but I think, yes, you don't feel like you can or you should, but you always have people that come to you, even now, right? You have family, friends that say, hey, do you have an hour? Can I, you know, a breakfast, a lunch? Would love to run my 401k or IRA by you. Hey, I'm looking at these two new angel deals. Can you break them down for me and tell me what you see? They would be shocked. And James, you did this a couple of times where you're like, sure, I'll meet you, but here's my rate. Here's what I charge. No one ever thinks they can roll to a lawyer's office or a doctor's office and just get an hour of their time for free. 
But when yeah. it comes to us, when it came to us, whether it be with trading or a fund or anything, and this was always what Omid was so good at and what he would say, listen, man, we're providing value. So we need to either say no or say, look, this is what the fee is. This is what it's, you know, it's going to cost. Now, I think all of us are at a point now where, and this is a big thing, and it's for another episode, James, where you always talk about permission marketing and stuff like that, where you can spend 10, 20, 30 hours a week meeting people and talking and giving advice and breaking things down, but it's, it's really inefficient and a waste of your time. You know, and that's what we were, I don't want to say we were doing or making the mistake back then, but you know, I think you're both right. But I think Oma just wanted to basically say, Hey, look, I mean, this is, this is, uh, you know, not, not worth our time, not valuable if we're going to take this money and work for free, you know, but, but yeah, with that being said, we got into the street and partnered with the street because of a deal that you struck, probably spur of the moment, came back to us and said, hey, great news. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, and, and I guess on the, the next episode, we'll talk about Stock Picker and all the other businesses we started and how that was just the craziest negotiation ever, not only getting our partners for that, but then the process by which we sold that company was just insane. and. But it was a good use of all kind of the experience we had had over the prior eight years. And it just got crazy. And I would say we still were trading after that. And we could yeah. talk. We, I remember we were trading through the financial crisis. We were not only still trading, but we were still trying to raise money, if you will, on, on the strategy behind Stock Picker, where we thought that was a great idea, where you could run a fund where you're piggybacking, you know, 13 Ds and Gs and following all the big investors. Well, I would say by this point, thinking of the phrase education of a speculator, which was the title of Victor's book, by this point, not only had we programmed and tested thousands of potential trading strategies and patterns in the market and so on, but we had also done due diligence on hundreds of hedge funds and all of their strategies. And we had researched and done writing about all these different strategies. We would professionally invested lots of different strategies. By this point, I would say, and this is after 10 years of investing uh, around this time, we we're starting to become good investors. <laughs> like, because there's so many issues. There's your level of risk. There's testing things. There's just understanding the ways you can get scammed because that's a big part of investing. Most companies out there are scams. And most hedge funds are scams. So you have to be able to weed out the criminals from the non-criminals. And it's not that easy as we discovered. So it was hard to build wisdom in investing, even after becoming good traders. Look, I still see it today, and I guarantee Omid sees it, and I know you do, James, where you come across people, usually younger, that will come up, and most people don't have any idea what any of us do. I know they know what you do, James, but I'm sure Omid gets approached all the time. What exactly do you do? Because you do so many things. I still don't know what right. Omid does no, anymore. No one does. No one does. Uh, you know, because, because I think that what we came out of, the three of us together, is we do a bunch of different things, whatever comes across our desk, right? And we're able to do that because of what we've all gone through. But when someone approaches me and they're 25, 26, 28, and they're out of an MBA or something, and they say, look, you know, I've been day trading for the last year. It's definitely what I need to do. It's what I want to do. My skill set aligns with it. I want to say, listen, I'm going to save you three, four, five years of pure misery. But I don't because they're not going to believe me. They're going to think they can, they're going to do it differently. They can withstand it. They understand it. They've read a new book that talks about what we've talked about. But the reality is they have to go through it. They have to go through it to understand yeah. what, what they can do. But it takes everything I have to not say, listen, go the other way. Do you guys regret being day traders? I mean, ultimately, no. we were day traders no. for like a decade. No. Not only do I not regret. I mean, no, not at all. I mean, there's so many great lessons you learn. I, I will tell you this, and Omid, I think, knows this. I've told Omid this. My dad's been a lifelong investor and he loves the markets and he's smart and he's a great investor. He talks about some of our trades still. He still, anytime I talk to him ever about oil, he will come up, he will reference Omid's oil trade. He will. 
Oh, don't don't remind me. I, I know, I, still... I know. Wait, I, I I vaguely remember Oman's oil trade. What was the oil trade? I fought the bull market in two thousand and eight for like two three months. That was back when I believe actually still the all time high in the West Texas Intermediary or Brent. One of them. Yeah, it was like two thousand six or seven, right? It was it hit one hundred fifty. I think it was eight, right before the financial crisis when the whole the peak oil theory thing was what was taking over and i i kid you not i believe the peak was like 148 dollars a yes. barrel on whatever the yeah. front month contract was i got margined out of my position in the future is at like 146.50 yeah and then yeah. i'd been around i've been trading long enough to know i was like this is the top i was like it's going to collapse now and then the remarkable thing though is that then it went straight to 100 and and uh, I was able to then catch a rebound from 100 to 120. Then I shorted. So I actually recovered those losses somehow. Yeah, yeah. But but I remember you you were so you called exactly what you thought was going to happen. You were trading it, and I remember I was taking step by step almost. I was every day I would update my dad on it. He'd say what because my dad was following it, and I said Omid, he's calling it to a T. And I remember when it collapsed and my dad said Omid was correct. And I go, Dad, he got he got margined out right at the top. <laughs> and and it was it's a great, it goes back to Justin's quote, James, about the Qualcomm short from way back when when oh, yeah. you know the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. And this is to your point too, about people listening to advice about day trading. Like I could tell somebody, you buy this stock. Let's even take an extreme. Let's say I know the future because I have psychic powers and I say, you should buy this stock and hold on to it. I would still give only a 10% chance that that person makes money on the stock yeah. because no one listens they don't. to advice. And even though we were doing quant trading and like we, the whole idea of quant trading is to not have your emotions involved, to listen to the computer, it was hard to make money oh, every day yeah. listening to the computer and not taken over like oh i know more than my sworn strategy yeah since we're talking about oil there's that famous i think william goldman quote about hollywood that nobody knows anything and i think it yeah. applies so much more to markets and finance and wall street because so 2008 oil peaked at 148 dollars a barrel the prevailing theory back then was peak oil that we were about to reach yeah. the point of yeah. peak production because Saudi Arabia was running out of oil or something, but demand would only ever go up and it was going to like $500 a barrel. 2009, the low in the, I think it was the March 2009 WTI contract was 30 because the economy 30. had just yep. collapsed. Then the shale boom starts with fracking and all that. And now the new theory is that like, there's just too much oil and the world can't get out from this under this oil glut and it's going to be a problem. And then that goes all the way to COVID where the low was negative $37 a barrel or something of the same yeah. contract. And now it's at 80 having gone over 100 and all the talk is we don't have enough oil. We've reached peak <laughs> oil. And this is your point of like nobody knows anything. And you find this. You have to really, you know, question the expertise of the so-called experts. And I know that politicizes this. I don't mean to politicize this. I'm not talking about the usual experts. But like JP Morgan a few weeks ago said something that struck me as so stupid and <laughs> irrational. I believe it was JP Morgan. They said the analyst says oil is going to $380 a barrel, which shows me that some of these people that paid an enormous amount of money to say to other professionals, oh, oil's going to $380 a barrel, doesn't really understand how life works. <laughs> like if oil's $380 a barrel, what are you paying for a gallon of gas? $30 for, per gallon? If that happens, nobody will drive cars anymore. Like the world will change so that oil will go down. Like inflation doesn't exist by itself. It's not a mathematical formula inflation changes people's behavior so that inflation doesn't happen. People don't understand that about inflation. Demand changes as prices go up. It doesn't stay the same. 
It's fascinating to see how Wall Street and, as you said, I mean, it's Washington, D.C., it's Wall Street, it's the media. They're all intertwined. But that's what keeps people coming back to the game. That's what keeps these young you know, people up, up and coming that think they can finally, they finally figured it out. They have an edge. And the reality is none of them have an edge. They don't. Yeah. And I will say, unlike you two guys, I will say I do regret day trading. Mm. I feel like, you know, I did that for 10 years on and off, but 10 years basically. And a lot of those 10 years was every day. And when you're day trading, it's 24 hours a day. It's not eight hours a day. It's 24 hours a day. And I feel like it took years of my life away from me. Not only the years I spent doing it, but just the stress levels. You're feeling fight or flight 100% of the time, but you're sitting. So, yeah. so you're not fighting and you're not fleeing. And so I think that has bad effects on the body, which I haven't seen yet, but I'm sure it took years off my life. And there were other things we could do. That was a great decade to build internet businesses. And you know, there were so many things. We were smart people. There were so many things we could have done. And we did the dumbest activity of all. The flip side is the day trader is, what's the Ayn Rand quote on day traders or on traders? Like you eat what you kill. Like you're only surviving if you're good. And we survived right. the hard way. And the reason you do it, we you can say you regret it, but the reason we were doing it was to try to get beyond where we were, right? I mean, we were close. I think we'd have, we'd have a different viewpoint if we stuck it out and, and all of a sudden we did graduate to the 100 million, to the billion. And then we probably, our approach would change. We could probably manage that process better. But where we operated in that zero to 50, zero to 70, and where we're you know, as Om had said, we're hustling every day and grinding and talking to investors and managing other investors. It's stressful. I mean, it's stressful. But, you know, if we said we were going to do something different, we just gave that up and said, oh, we're going to build this business. There's stress involved with that, too. We would have had all the same issues we had. Oh, oh my God. Well, we'll get to it. Yeah. The stock picker, that was one of the most stressful. <laughs> everything's, you're right. Yeah. Everything's stressful. So that'll be the next episode. But Dan and Omid, thanks so much for joining this episode of another episode of Wall Street Insane. The next one is going to be brutally insane. Omid, since the last episode, you've published a book, uh, one of the best books ever, maybe the best book ever about Bitcoin, Rearchitecting Trust. Horrible title, great book. <laughs> uh, uh, how's the book doing? Thank you. The book is out there. The sales are anemic. So perhaps you were right about the title or perhaps you know, crypto's down in summertime. Or what, Why don't you just rename it? What would you suggest I rename it to? Your second book on, on crypto. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, you all know the basics, but here's the real deal. The now. real deal? How about, I, yeah. I was joking with someone like, how about like, Eight Effective Trading Strategies for Flipping Monkey Pictures. Yeah. <laughs> NFTs and, yeah. and Bored Apes and stuff are all the rage. Or just call it the only crypto book you will ever need to read. That's not bad. And James, this will also be on the next episode with Stock Picker, and Omid knows this very well. But a huge part about kind of post-Stock Picker, but with Stock Picker, was we became very good at publishing articles or posting articles that that quickly became most well read or, or you know had the most views strictly because of the title strictly <laughs> because of the title it it didn't matter what we put in the article at all if if the title was right it would be widely read and and so yeah we were the masters of that we were Every article would go viral. It was like magic. And I got in, in, and that's hurt me in some other weird ways, actually, which we could talk about next episode. I had the ability of great titles for about 10, 15 years. And more recently, I feel like I've lost it, maybe because I have gotten so many much criticism for those titles. And it was never, people would accuse us of clickbait. It's, it was never clickbait, where the titles were always yeah. honest. But maybe just having thousands of accusations affected me ultimately. I will say just on Omid's book, the title, that's a James thing, but the articles from the book and the chapters that you post like on LinkedIn are excellent. They're excellent. Very informative. And that's coming from someone that 
knows uh, a minimal about not much about crypto, everyone should get your book and read those chapters and read those articles you're posting. It's very, very good. I mean, I've done a lot of episodes about crypto and Bitcoin and so on. I would say you and one other person, Tasha Che, that, that episode just came out recently from Tasha Labs, are, are the most knowledgeable about crypto that I've interviewed. And some crypto experts that I've interviewed know zero. So there's a wide range of crypto experts. And I would say you and Tasha were up there in terms of like where this is going to be, not just six months from like everyone cares oh what's bitcoin's price going to be three months from now what's anybody but the important thing about crypto that people forget is there's a vision and a future and there's a reason why this is so revolutionary and keeping your eye on the bigger picture is what you guys explained very well and informed me so that was good thank you and to bring it full circle i think one of the advantages i have compared to a lot of other people in crypto is all the years when we spent together doing things in different parts of the traditional financial system yeah. I think understanding how markets work, how Wall Street works, how money works, not just from an academic perspective, but having experienced a lot of it is very valuable in trying to then educate others on how crypto is different, how it might be better, and how the two might merge in the years to come. And people don't really get that. I guess this is where having lived through some of these situations matters. Like, I'll say something and then trolls on Twitter will do their thing just because they're never really going, they have no experience. They're never really going to understand some of these issues unless they're open-minded, which most people aren't. And Dan, since our last Wall Street Insane, I will offer condolences. You had a close family member pass away. Everybody remember to take your blood pressure medication and exercise every day, which I don't do, by the way, because exercise is real boring. I know you exercise every day, Dan, but aren't you bored? Like, wait, just, just running is boring. To it's me. very important, very important for mental and physical health. And look, we can tie that back into everything we've done, day trading and all the things we do. If you aren't taking care of yourself mentally and physically, you're going to have a tough time succeeding in, you know, what you do day to day. So it's very, very important to stay physically and mentally healthy. Which is ultimately the message of Wall Street Insane, of these episodes. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> All right, you guys. See you next time. All right, time. thank you. Thank you. In Tresto, Sucubitril Volsartan Tablets is the number one heart failure brand prescribed by cardiologists and has helped over one million people with heart failure. It's a prescription medicine that treats adults with long-lasting chronic heart failure and works better when the heart cannot pump a normal amount of blood to the body. Don't take Entresto if pregnant. It can cause harm or death to an unborn baby. Don't take Entresto with an ACE inhibitor or Alice Kieran, or if you've had angioedema with an ACE or ARB. Don't take with Alice Kieran or within 36 hours of taking an ACE inhibitor. The most serious side effects are angioedema, low blood pressure, kidney problems, or high blood potassium. Angioedema is swelling of your face, lips, tongue, and throat that may cause death. If it causes difficulty breathing, get emergency help. Ask your doctor about Entresto. To learn more, visit support.entresto.com or call 833-446-6699. For pricing, visit entresto.com backslash cost. If you can't afford your medication, Novartis may be able to help. Welcome back to our studio where we have a special guest with us today, Toucan Sam from Fruit Loops. Toucan Sam, welcome. It's my pleasure to be here. Oh, and um, it's Fruit Loops, just so you know. Uh, fruit. Fruit. Yeah, fruit. No, it's Fruit Loops. The same way you say studio. That's not how we say it. Fruit Loops, find the loopy side.